Good evening, everybody. Good to see you here. Crowd is down. It kind of reminds me of a story I heard one time about a new preacher went to a congregation to preach, and he asked the, the elders of the church, what do you think that we need lessons on the most? And they gave him a list, a list of about 12 things, and the first one on the list was attendance. And uh, so Sunday morning came, and he got up, preached, preached on the importance of attendance. Sunday evening came, he got up, and he preached on the subject, the importance of attendance. Following Sunday, same thing. And then after both, sun or both services that Sunday, when the elders got him after church, he said, you know, we know we gave you a list, but you know, you don't have to just stay with the first one for a month. He said, well, I figure when I see improvement on the first thing, I'll move on to something else. But I'm not going to preach on attendance. Um, I'm going to talk on a subject a little bit in the line of what Chuck did this morning. He preached on repentance. Well, I'm going to re uh, preach on what makes that important. That's the topic of sin. And then we're going to look at one very important question that most of you may know or not know. Is, is there one sin worse than another? Pretty much the, uh, um, the definition of sin could be defined as sin is any thought or action that falls short of God's will. God is perfect and anything that we do that falls short of his perfection is sin. All sins are kind of like in the same category in the sense that every sin makes a person guilty and deserving of God's wrath. We read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is, there is sin not leading to death. Also in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, we read, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. When we think about our sins, we can't blame others for our sins. We have the choice to do something or not do it. And sometimes doing things is a sin, sometimes not doing things is a sin. We can't be excused from sin because we didn't know. That's, that's a famous thing, especially when you're a child. Your parents punish you for doing something bad. Well, I didn't know it was wrong. You know, nobody told me. Well, yeah, you were. As we look back at where sin got its start from, back in Genesis, all of us here, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of Adam and Eve and how they, God placed them in the Garden of Eden and told them they could eat of every fruit of the trees except for one. And later on, um, it started off with Eve being tempted. And we're going to read that, that part of the story in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any, uh, any animal or of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, 
from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree that which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. And then if you go on to read the the rest of the story, you'll find that they, later on in the evening, they heard God's voice walking, coming through the garden, and they hid from him. And he asked them where they were at, and of course they said, we were naked and we were ashamed, and God asked them, how did you know you was naked? And then they relayed to God what they had done. We read a New Testament accounting of this same event, not an exact accounting, but the consequences of such. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, Therefore, just as one man, through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread in all mankind, because all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not counted against anyone when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the violation committed by Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the gracious gift is not like the offense, for by the offense of the one the many died, much more than the grace of God, by the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who had sinned, for on one hand the judgment arose from one offense, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the gracious gift arose from the many offenses, resulting in justification. For if by the offense of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as though one offense, the result was condemnation to all mankind, so also through one act of righteousness, the result was justification of life to all mankind. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the offense would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, so also grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. So we, we need to be very thankful that we had Jesus Christ to come and make this sacrifice for us, because without him we would be lost eternally. Another thought along the lines of the thought of sin is many times. And again, referring back to like children, you, fall in, you can fall into a false security of, well, I may be guilty of this sin, but I didn't do that. And I didn't do what Kathy did, and that's worse than anything. So we're, we're all guilty. If you're guilty, you're guilty. There's, there's truly not um, most normal sins are not one worse than another and the fact that any of them will cause you to be condemned. 
In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we need to be very careful not to fall into false thinking that we aren't as bad as someone else. I've heard a lot of people say through the years that, you know, I, I might miss service now and then, or um, I might lose my temper and say a few curse words, but I'm not as bad as Joe down the road that beats on his wife and goes out and gets drunk all the time. And he's probably cheating on her too, but now I can't prove that, but I mean, I'm not as bad as what that guy is. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, the topic, is there a sin which is unforgivable? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31 and 32, Therefore I say unto you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him in this age or in any age to come. We're also commanded to obey the laws of the land. And that's one thing about the laws of the land, you know, there's a certain tolerance in a lot of our common laws. Um, speed laws, for example. Now, maybe, maybe if you didn't know this, maybe I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to. Law enforcement officers are required to allow you five to seven miles over the speed limit because of inconsistencies in speedometers. Now, if you know for a fact that your speedometer is accurate, you can get away with speeding, driving seven miles over the speed limit without getting a ticket. However, if you're gonna do that, make sure that your speedometer is accurate or at least on the low side. Drinking and driving, another one, you know, you're, and it, it's a very low tolerance on that, and it should well be, but um, you're allowed so much alcohol in your system because some medications and other such things have alcohol in them, so you're allowed up to a certain percentage, and I'm not real sure what that is today as I stand here. I've not had to concern myself with that for a long, long time, and I really don't ever want to again. We read in Romans, again, Paul speaking in chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, Every person is to be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for the good behave for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have a fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. That's that's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? All we got to do is don't break the law, and we don't have anything to worry about normally. Of course, there's exceptions that don't always go your way on that, too. Um, there are many laws where a simple accusation can get you convicted of a crime that you may not have committed. All depends on what kind of circumstantial evidence can be brought against you in cases like that. And when it comes to being guilty or not guilty, We need to be careful about judging others. Jesus tells us not to judge others. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. 
For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, your eye, and look, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your, your brother's eye. I'm sure we've all run across somebody from time to time that has accused somebody of something and they have even bigger faults in their own life, but they're blinded by looking at someone else, not thinking about their own faults. I think it's probably a good practice to more worry about your own sins than your brother's. Some things may be blatant and, and should be addressed. Um, just depending on what they are. All circumstances vary, but my own personal philosophy is that my sins can't condemn you and you can't save me from my sins. So if I take care of my own life, that's the best measure that I have for myself. And the same should be for you too. Make sure your own life is well with God before you're going to be in condemning of someone else. What is your condition now? If the world were to end today, would you be saved? Do you feel confident that you are? I remember one time um, a person told me, well, I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. I said, really, how do you know that? I go to church, thinking that's all we needed to do, just be faithful and attend the church. Well, if we study the Bible, we'll find there's a lot more to it than attending church. We are, there are things we are commanded to do, we are to teach others, we are to live a good Christian life, or not to um, make a stumbling block for someone else. You now we have a song in our songbook called We Are the World's Bible. And that song is very true. Sometimes we are the only Bible the world will read. If they look at us and they can't see Christ, there's something wrong. So, again, let's make sure our lives are clean before we go condemning someone else. Now, I think there are, well, it's not that I think, I know, okay, I know, that there are, especially in the uh, churches that have elders and such, it's their job, as, as well as preachers to some extent, to keep the people in the congregation along a godly path. And that's why they're called overseers. You know, sometimes we are just like a flock of lambs, man. We're out there running around, falling into stuff that we shouldn't be, banging our heads into stuff that we should have backed away from. And these people are put in there in place to keep us from making these mistakes and hurting ourselves and hurting others. So if you're here tonight and you have things that are on your mind that you would like help with from the congregation, you would like prayers, please feel free to come forward and make those things known. Um, I believe everyone here is, is a Christian already, so uh, we probably don't need to go into the uh, extent of what it takes to become a Christian. I, I believe you all know. So if, if you're here tonight and you have any needs, you need prayers, please, please feel free to do so as we stand and sing the song of invitation.